So you have to just act like you can see me, Joseph, even though you're just yeah. staring at your slides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when I get to the end of the presentation, I'll just like leave the full screen mode. Is that fine? Yeah, that's fine. So that's we're fine. live and hanging out. So uh, Joseph. Hi there. Hi. You want to tell people where you are right now? Yeah, so right now what you're seeing is the business center of my um, apartment complex. I just moved over the holiday weekend. Um, we drove something like 40 hours in the span of three days. Um, oh so we're, we're just beginning to settle in and unpack it, everything. But um, that's, that's where I am now. I have internet here. So, <laughs> so that's yeah. good. Yeah. So typically, let's see, when you and I first met, mm -hmm. you were living in Michigan. Yes. And then a couple of years ago, you were living in Denver. Mm -hmm. And now you are in San Francisco. Yeah. 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 So I, I grew up in Michigan, um, spent, you know, most of my life there, pretty much all of my life until about a year ago, actually, I moved to Denver. Um, I spent a year there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it's a really lovely place. Um, I probably would, could see myself living there for a long time. But, you know, between, you know, all the aspects of life, we ended up um, kind of abruptly packing up and moving out to the Bay Area, and that's where I am now. So, <laughs> as of like a day and a half ago. Yay! Just a day and a half. That's awesome. So, yeah. Joseph is in San Francisco, and I am in Los Angeles. I'd love to hear from you guys where you're from. Let us know where you're calling from. Use the chat bar on the right and let us know where you're uh, listening from today. Um, also, if you have any questions, of Joseph, please put in mm -hmm. the questions and topics tab underneath our video screen. But we're just going to wait a couple minutes here and chit chat while we're getting started. Again, if you can let us know where you're viewing us, that'd be awesome. If you're in California, we'd love to hear from you or anywhere in the middle. That would be cool too. So Johnny is from Boston. Oh, you know, wow. I love that town. I love Boston. Um, yeah. If it wasn't so cold, I'd probably end up there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the streets are so gorgeous. Yeah, a lot of history. Right, right. Johnny, how long have you been in Boston? Two years so far. Awesome. So we're from before that. Yeah. Johnny, where, where are you from before Boston? Indiana. Oh, hey, so the Midwest. Midwest yeah. <laughs> I was born in Michigan. Did I tell you that, Joseph? Oh, no, I did not know that. <laughs> I was oh, born wow. in Michigan. So, so yeah, I was from the Midwest, too. So wow. that's a big move, yes, from mm -hmm. Indiana to Boston. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, though. Love that. Um, but, yeah, now I'm in Los Angeles in sunny L.A. And uh, who knows how long I'll stay here. We'll see. I mean, if it's anything like you, Joseph, you're moving yeah. around a lot. You never know where yeah. you're going to be, right? <laughs> you never know. Oh, my gosh. The best laid plants of mice and men, as they say. Right. Excellent. So where in San Francisco are you today? Yeah. So Fair I'm much. actually um, north, um, like more Oakland, Emeryville. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not really San Francisco proper, but, you know, that just Bay Area generally. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful up there right now, too. It is. It's, it's actually been kind of chilly the past couple of days, um, you know, overcast and everything. And it doesn't it doesn't really feel like what you'd envision as California. But I guess, you know, Northern California is very different from SoCal. It's very different. <laughs> so, it's very different. Yeah. yeah. And it's nice and cool. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's cool throughout the whole summer, which is really admirable because here in California, or Southern California, it's very smoggy. Yeah, yeah. I find it very pleasant. Actually, I like co cooler temperatures generally. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm cool. pretty, pretty at home. <laughs> so we have some people just coming in. As you're coming in, please let us know where you're calling in from. Uh, Joseph and I are just going to get started, but we'd love to know where you're calling in from. Joseph is in San Francisco, and he's been there for exactly a day and a half. Yeah. So he's a, very, he's a brand new resident of San Francisco. Of course, I am in Los Angeles. And Johnny's in Boston, and he's from Indiana. So. There's quite a few people in the room. I just don't know uh, if you're typing in. Please mm -hmm. let us know. So as we get started, I know you can't see us, right, Joseph? No, I can't see you. I'm looking at my, my little slides here. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll just get started as you let us know where you're uh, calling in from. 
So, you know, welcome to Topography Dojo. We do this about every two weeks, mm -hmm. although in two weeks, I'm not sure if we'll be having one. We'll see. The summer is very mm -hmm. difficult for people, yeah. right? There's so many people on vacation or, or moving across country like Joseph is. Mm -hmm. um, I am Rachel Elnar, and I'm in Los Angeles. I'm the producer of Type Ed, a topography education program here that we run in Los Angeles and also online. And I'm joined by Joseph Alessio, and we had met uh, in TypeCon, Washington, D.C., about three years ago, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Was that your first TypeCon, Joseph? Um, second, actually. I'd second? been the year previous, and I... Yeah, I liked it enough to come back. <laughs> what was the one that you were at before? Um, it was in Milwaukee, which Milwaukee. was pretty interesting. It's not the the largest city, mm -hmm. um, but it's it had a lot of you know history, a lot of old like um, breweries around there with great great old signage, you know, oh, the yeah. ghost signs and everything. It was a good good location. Were you just getting your start in lettering at that time? Yeah, I was very very intrigued um, and thought I wanted to do more type design, and then. I kind of saw, you know, everything that went into it. And it was like, you know, I think I'm really more suited to a more illustrative approach. You know, as pedantic as I can be, I, I don't think I have quite that amount of patience. So it's kind of, <laughs> that conference influenced my trajectory a little bit, actually. Well, there's quite a few people who are uh, RSVP'd for this call, but not everybody's on. So if you could do us a favor and yeah. use the share button underneath, uh, underneath our video, there's a share button. Click on that and let everyone know that we're just getting started. Hey, Erica, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Uh, we're just getting started, so uh, please let everyone know that we're just about to start. Joseph has a little talk prepared, so I'm really excited uh, to see. And I'm also, my biggest question is how did you rack up 12,000 followers on Instagram and how long did it take you to do that? Oh, man, that that is a good question. I honestly... Um... I think I joined Instagram probably, I'm going to say a year and a half ago or so. Oh, um, oh it was like summer of, um, I guess, yeah, I believe it would have, well, maybe closer to two years now. Um, but it, it honestly, um, I didn't put a lot of, of, you know, planning into it or anything. Um, but I tried to post consistently and, um, you know, when, when you post consistently and kind of, you know, get certain people to post you enough, you know, then you begin to accrue a lot of interest. Mm. Um, so, so I tried to do my best at posting good content, um, coming with the original content and everything, um, and kind of slowly accrued a, a pretty significant following. Um, at this point, I'm wondering if it's now, um, you know, going to kind of, if it's going to be less effective than it has been simply because of the way Instagram has changed. Hmm. Um, and so it, it might, I'm worried it might end up damaging the, um, you know, people who interact with a lot of people via Instagram um, and they might not be able to, you know, see, get as many eyes on their work and things like that. Um, so we'll see what happens in the next few months. Can you explain but, the change? Hey, I don't know what's happened. Yeah, well, they, they introduced a new algorithm um, similar to what they did with Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Facebook acquired Instagram and are kind of Facebookifying the platform slowly but surely over the past year or two. Um, and so now with this algorithm, it's not actually um, chronological. You'll scroll through, scroll through your feed and see something that's like two hours next to something that's, you know, 15 minutes ago. And they sort of reorder it um, based on like what you like more often or interact with more often or certain users you interact with more often, things like that, yeah. hashtags. Um, and so then you'll be getting a lot of certain kinds of contact or content um, and then other kinds of content that you might follow, you might really not see much of at all um, if, if it ever shows up. Mm. So depending on how much you scroll. So, so it'll be interesting to see how that affects the platform um, and how honestly, if, if it will survive the change, because I don't think really people want the algorithm deciding what they see rather than they deciding what they see. So we'll see. <laughs> of course. Still, a year and a half yeah. to have 12,000 followers, that's that's quite an accomplishment. So, no, well, wow. it, it took a lot of, but yeah, it it's, I guess, like posting a lot um, and regularly and, um, you know, just posting good work is a pretty foolproof. No, I think the good work definitely yeah. helps. So uh, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them underneath the questions and topics tab, and then we'll get started. Is that okay with you, Joseph? Yeah, I'll yeah, just absolutely. Go focus right onto your screen, so go ahead. Sounds yeah. good. Well, 
Hi, I'm Joseph, um, and I'm here to talk about words um, because you know words are pretty cool. Honestly, um, I don't know if I have I have a lot of words that I could use to describe words, and that gets pretty meta. <laughs> but I think I think honestly, we're all here um, because we all have some some sort of interest in words, um, probably their visual form, you know, type and lettering, um, and words are just they're just endlessly fascinating to me um, i call myself a typographic illustrator which is really just a fancy way of saying that i love reimagining language in image form um you know whether typography type design lettering calligraphy you know all different different ways we reimagine the the abstract concept of words in a visual form um, and we're, we're interacting with them constantly. You're reading words on a page. You're hearing me speak words. Um, pretty much every minute of our waking lives, we're interacting with words in some form. Um, and despite the fact that they're ubiquitous, uh, I find words to be really incredibly special in the way that they're almost like a living organism. They mutate, um, they lose meaning, they gain new meanings. Um, sometimes they kind of lose their place in our culture and disappear, you know, lost to the ages. And sometimes they're introduced en masse, um, you know, like Shakespeare is thought to have coined, I think something like um, 1,700 words all on his own, just introducing words into the culture and we're still using a lot of them today. Um, and then, you know, we, we lose words a lot as well. Um, you know, cultural shifts, cultures die. Um, sometimes languages die with them. They're fossilized as with Latin, you know, set in stone. Um, you know, kind of a skeleton of a culture that we can go back and read and learn from. And um, just the, the power of words is really, it's incredible. Um, the way that we, we can interact, the way that we can communicate abstractly through words. And um, yeah, it's just, I find them so fascinating. I think it's all, it's all very dramatic as a living organism, you know, sometimes fossilized, sometimes, you know, you can mal it's, it's malleable. You can work with it, um, change it, reimagine it, show it. Um, you know, words are just really exciting to me. Um, so I'm, I could talk about words all day, but I'm probably boring you. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, but so I'll, I'll move on to who I am and why I'm here and um, why I am talking about words with an enthusiasm unknown to mankind. <laughs> So as you may know, if you, you looked at any of my profiles online, um, I'm a left-handed, self-taught, letter-loving Midwestern kid. Um, as you may have, may have deduced from the Jim Harbaugh quote that I snuck in there, um, you know, carefully, I was born very near Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, go Blue. I don't know if anyone here is, likes college sports or not, but <laughs> um, when I gave this talk, last I was actually in um, SEC country so that I probably could have gotten some booze if anyone in the room had been interested in <laughs> those programs there. But anyway, so um, one thing I guess that I think is really important to understanding uh, me, why I am the way I am and how I learn and operate is that um, I was homeschooled and um, this probably isn't a surprise to you because clearly I'm nerdy as fuck. Um, the way, you know, like I don't know if anyone's here has seen Mean Girls. Um, <laughs> I saw Mean Girls a couple of years ago because, because a friend mm -hmm. made me, um, and I, you know, hadn't really seen many movies. But um, it, I think it displays a pretty, a pretty decent stereotypical image of homeschoolers um, <laughs> that I actually fit pretty well. You know, very um, socially inept. Uh, you know, nerdy beyond belief. Um, definitely out of out of touch with pop culture. Um, and although you know, like. Lindsay Lohan was definitely more attractive than most homeschoolers are. Um, it presents a fa fairly good image of, you know, how how you might expect me to, you know, have grown up. Um, you know, just I, I loved learning. Um, I was very nerdy. Um, I, you know, I feel that also gives a great excuse for any ridiculous faux pas I may commit as well, because, you know, it's just, you can kind of expect homeschoolers to be weird. So there's that. It's a perfect, perfect excuse to pull out. <laughs> but it really, uh, it really has affected the way that I learn and the way I approach things, um, you know, because I was um, one out of seven kids and, you know, one mom can only teach so many kids at one time. Um, I ended up having to teach myself a lot, you know, go through textbooks, figure things out on my own. And so I would uh, work with my hands a lot. I would, um, you know, read out of these textbooks that were beyond my grade level and 
quickly developed a fascination for big words. Seven <laughs> um, kids? Been, oh my gosh, what a big family. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> um, you know, definitely pros and cons to it, but I, I think it really um, affected, you know, the way that I, I learned how to learn, especially working on my own um, and really having to self-educate um, consistently just out of necessity. Um, and it kind of became a way of life for me and how I, how I enjoy doing things now. Um, you know, and I would, I would learn to go out and find resources. Um, you know, I would discover resources on my own, invest time in them. Um, and because I didn't really have any formal education per se, um, you know, I just figured things out as I went, <laughs> which is really what I've been doing ever since. Um, and then another, another aspect of that is that I, um, quickly, you know, grew a very strong relationship with words because, um, you know, you, I didn't spend a lot of time with other kids. I didn't spend a lot of time out, outside as much. I would read a lot. Um, and so my, my primary educator was the written word. And I think that's, that's affected how I see words and my relationship with words and how I um, get excited about reimagining them visually because they're just the medium through which I've learned and communicated, you know, my entire life. Um, I would do a lot of drawing, a great form of education. Um, you know, you can, you know, a pen and paper presents just a world of exploration um, that you can you can delve into. And actually, um, that's kind of part of what sparked my my fascination with drawing letters. Um, my older brother took up an interest in calligraphy when I was pretty young, and he had this book. I went ahead and found the um, oops, that was supposed to be a while back. <laughs> this book cover here, um, uh, an old old book that just shows some standard calligraphy. Um, you know, and it, it you know taught your your uncials, fractor, curling, and um, all those things, and um, I didn't really have proper tools, and so I would just use a pen and paper. And instead of using, you know, the the proper pen nibs to draw the forms, I would just, you know, draw them out using outlines. And that was my my first real introduction to lettering. Um, and I, I had no idea that it was actually a, a, you know, historically supported discipline that has been around for hundreds of years that people have have you know done for a living. Um, I just thought it was, you know, like making, you know, drawing cool forms on a page. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, but I, I figured um, that I, I was really interested in art, but because I was self-taught and I wasn't probably going to college, I should teach myself um, some way to turn design into a career. Um, and so I figured design was a pretty good option. You know, it's close enough to art drawing things that, um, you know, I would still be interested in. But I really thought that the only thing I could do was web design. I didn't realize, you know, that like illustration, um, you know, all these other careers were out there to, to be made. Um, so I taught myself HTML and CSS. Um, I got a job as a web designer and I was miserable. <laughs> I really did like it. Um, I wasn't very good at it. That was another reason that I was miserable because I don't like, you know, doing something that I just feel like I'm, I'm not really producing something that I can be proud of. Um, and so while I was doing that, you know, I wasn't really working with my hands at all, um, unless you count, you know, using a keyboard um, to type code. So I would, um, you know, draw on the side and, um, you know, dabble in like drawing posters and things like that um, just for fun. And, um, you know, try to develop some of those skills along the side while I was working as a web designer. Um, so it was a pretty, a pretty natural segue back into, um, you know, playing with letters because, you know, I would draw posters and a, a large component of poster art is often, you know, hand-drawn lettering. Um, and so, I, I started doing some of that. Um, I actually, I'm going to be really um, transparent with you all and show you my first um, attempts at hand lettering that I put on the internet. It was a poster I designed for some um, competition or something like that. And I guess it, it won because they didn't have very high standards. And so I got this massive printout of this poster that I had designed. Um, wow. And yeah, that, as you can see, <laughs> I really had no sense for, um, you know, type and lettering at all. My, even just visually, you know, compositionally, um, it was, it was pretty horrific. You know, I, I obviously didn't even know how to use Adobe Illustrator. Um, but that was, that was one of my first, first attempts. Um, <laughs> well, I love that you shared this with us. Yeah, there it is. I mean, you know, we all start somewhere and this, um, you know, I actually still have this print, um, that I just keep around to, 
you know, just for sentiment's sake, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and sometimes I use like the the back of it for like a big white white background <laughs> uh, for photos as well. So it, it's practical as well. But uh, but yeah, there it is. That's kind of where I started uh, with with lettering. Um, you know, definitely early stages of figuring everything out. But what really helped me, aside from just trying to you know do it on the fly, was I um, I dabbled with um, lettering and posted it on Dribble, and um, there was a really good um, small tight knit community that wasn't shy about giving really honest and detailed um, critique of others' work, and so there were a few people on there that made great friends um, and that really helped me grow um, and kind of provided de facto education um, because you know I really had no formal education, and while there are resources online, there's nothing quite like someone who knows what they're doing and is able to take a look at your work, especially something very technical like lettering, where there are so many, I don't know, just the minutia that go into the, um, you know, the, the even the simplest of forms and show you, you know, where you're doing it wrong, what, what looks right, what it should look like, um, you know, all those things. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'm, I think, you know, critique is really, really valuable. Um, I think you make the best friends when you're growing together. Um, I made some really great friends on Dribble, actually, um, that I still, you know, get along with quite well today. I um, mean, you know, whether we're talking all the time or like there's just sporadic emails, but it's it's great for building relationships, um, growing growing in design with people, I think, um, because really you, the best friends are made when growing together. Um, I might make a little deviation here about critique. Um, critique is really in, incredibly important, especially for me having been self-taught um, without, you know, a lot of formal education, any formal education and resources. Um, you know, I feel like we need to do more to go out of our way to seek critique um, because we tend to have this kind of artist mentality often, I think, even designers where um, we, we feel offended if somebody has something to say about our work that needs to be changed, um, you know, things like that. But you can also give critique and help others, you know, as long as you're giving critique in the spirit of helping others grow rather than, you know, simply being negative about it. Um, it's a really, really valuable um, thing to give somebody. And it's always something that you should be seeking out as well. Um, so end in, in of rabbit trail there. Um, eventually, I started um, getting some small, small gigs and things with lettering and type related things. I did some writing. Um, I was taking a very very technical approach. This is a little graphic that I made for an article I wrote for Smashing Magazine a few years ago. Um, you know, just kind of, I, you can see how, how nerdy I was about all of this, <laughs> um, taking everything with this is very, very scholarly kind of approach, um, writing about, you know, type classification. Um, I invested a lot in understanding the history of letter forms, um, the cultural movements behind different styles um, and design movements, things like that. Um, and I did a lot of um, vector-based work too. This was really fun to do. Um, it's not every day you get to, you know, make a design and it gets laser engraved on a boom box. Um, and that, that was a lot of fun, but it's, you know, very, very fine detailed uh, vector work. Um, and that was, that really appealed to my, my OCD nature. <laughs> I was having a lot of fun with that. You know, and Joseph, feedback. how did you produce that? Did you um, just send off a vector file? Yeah, well, the guy that was actually putting together the boom boxes, um, who reached out to me to help with it, um, he had it was quite an arduous process for him because of the way it was constructed and the way that um, the lasers would like certain woods would warp under the lasers and things like that. So it went through a lot of iterations before um, it got to this final version. But I just essentially shipped a vector file um, to the guy who was putting these together. Mm -hmm. And they got it laser engraved, um, and he he like put the electronics together by hands, just fitted the boxes together. You can see the um, the um, fittings kind of on the corners and everything. Um, and yeah, so it's all handmade. Um, there were I think he did two runs of them. They were a limited edition, and I think they sold out of both runs already, unfortunately. So I don't think it's available anymore unless you find someone you know, who's willing to resell one in case you want one, but it's gorgeous. It, yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun to participate in. Um, and obviously his, his vision for like, you know, a laser engraved wooden boot box is pretty, pretty fun. And it, it was really fun to be able to take advantage of just the fine details you can fit in with laser engraving. Oh, really nice. So yeah, that, that was, that was awesome. I, I still have it of course. And yeah, it's a fun little, um, 
I don't know, just fun fun way to have a piece of work in your hands. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really liked the ornate things, the historical styles. Um, mm -hmm. But after a while, I started feeling like I was kind of spinning my wheels creatively. I felt like I was I invested so much in um, execution and um, a base of knowledge behind you know everything. Um, but I wasn't investing as much into conceptual thinking, um, and I wanted to get more into um, I guess just conceptual pieces, personal projects that that felt more uh, I don't know less like an exercise and more like something you know you could could view as a piece of art. Um, you know, one kind of a thought-provoking basis for for projects. So um, I, I wanted to kind of work with things that were meaningful to me. Um, and one of those was music. Music has been a big part of my life. I play a number of instruments um, and violin is one of those. And so it seemed a natural, a natural way to, um, I don't know, make an artistic piece using a violin. Um, so I found a quote that's dubious, attrib dubiously attributed to Plato. Um, I don't think it's found in any of his extant works, but um, it's it, it was attributed to him, I think, as early as 1880 something. And um, so it's, you know, whether or not he actually said it is up in the air, but it's a beautiful mm -hmm. quote just about, about music, about music giving soul to the universe, um, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And it, um, you know, it, it's just, it kind of describes music in this very, very poetic manner. Um, and so I thought, well, how can I kind of visually communicate the beauty of music and the beauty of these words together? Um, so I got this, this violin, it was a cheap one, so I didn't feel bad about slathering it in paint. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I kind of documented the process as um, I, you know, put together the, the you know, the piece, the video. Um, and so I might as well, I think I'll go ahead and show this one. It's just like two minutes or something like that. So here's the video. How did you film this, may I ask? Um, I filmed this with my, um, I just I just used like a Canaan Rebel. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear the music. Probably not. I but there's cannot. there's supposed to be music along with it as well. <laughs> so yeah, so I just got a tripod um, and kind of set it up, and you know, I figured I had like a white background and a black background that I did some of the work on because it kind of went with the colors of the piece. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm kind of filming it as I worked on it. No, I saw this photo uh, in the Skillshare class, actually. That you oh, yeah. Yeah, you have a couple of, of screen grabs that I have, you know, for, um, you know, just showing off everything. But, yeah. So since we can't hear the music, could you talk a little bit about your planning process on an object like this? Yeah, so what I did here was um, I, I did a lot of sketching beforehand. I didn't, I don't really show any of my sketch papers uh, but as you can see, like I'm kind oh, of yeah. showing how I actually went ahead and used a pencil to draw lightly on the the violin mm -hmm. um, and kind of just transferred the sketch. It was really interesting, like kind of iterating it in a large form, um, you know, from this tiny like one, two inch sketch. Um, <laughs> and it kind of changed a little bit as well as I fit it onto the actual piece. Um, but yeah, and then I, you know, kind of left the space for the the tail piece that I'm putting on here. And everything like that. Um, yeah, so I just started with sketches, you know, sketched directly onto the violin as well. And then, um, yeah, just took the, the paint marker and did it as I went. It changed a little bit just because, you know, when you're working with the marker, um, it's going to look a little bit different than it does in pencil. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was <laughs> back when I was attempting to grow a beard. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was an ill-fated attempt, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the violin was playable. Um, it sounded pretty awful um, because oh. it was really cheap, but it, it, it didn't make sound. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was a really fun fun way that I, I figured out to kind of, um, you know, turn turn something that was important into me into, you know, sort of a piece of art by combining it with something else that was important to me in letters um, and, you know, the musical aspect, the lettering aspect. 
Um, and I, I really liked how I got to think conceptually in putting all that together between the quote, you know, the medium. Um, and so I actually did another one with um, some, I did like some Neil Young lyrics on a guitar. Um, and that was really fun as well. Um, you know, the guitar again was, was, you know, barely playable when I was done with it, but <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, but after I was done with these, um, I wanted to kind of delve further into the conceptual thinking. So I started a series called um, Tools of the Trade. It was kind of, it was a really time intensive series, but it was one, definitely one of my more popular side projects. Um, and the idea behind it was kind of that there are like certain mental tools that, you know, designers or illustrators, particularly freelancers should have, um, you know, just dealing with life. Um, I kind of we was working through at that point some anxiety and um, imposter syndrome. <laughs> and I think like probably everyone who sees this will be able to relate all too well um, to those those feelings. Um, and so I figured, well, what can I, you know, kind of iterate um, to just say, you know, how do you deal with things like that? Um, you know, I had a series of blog posts that went along with the pieces, um, you know, things like, you know, shit happens and it's not always your fault. You know, it's just, it does, or, you know, maybe it's not your fault at all, you know, um, but you just learn from it um, and, and move on. Um, and, you know, like just showing up every day, um, you know, is obviously important, even when you're not feeling it, um, <laughs> things like that. Um, you know, working, working, not just, you know, people say work, work smart, not hard, but the reality is you need both, you know, and also um, the, the flip side of the coin is you can work hard, but if you're not working smart as well, um, then, you know, you'll just exhaust yourself. So you have to kind of combine those two, two lines of thinking. Um, so that was a really fun series, kind of addressed some things that I was feeling at the moment. Um, and it resonated with a lot of people. And um, I, I really was enjoying, um, you know, thinking more conceptually, kind of uh, abstracting the concepts, um, abstracting the letter forms, using different surfaces, um, different media. And then I, I decided that it would be even more fun um, to incorporate motion with, with what I was doing. So I um, started making little pieces like this one here um, because I figured, well, if I'm already working in three dimensions, um, you know, why not, why not work with four? Um, mm. Because like time, you know, traditionally being considered the fourth dimension kind of added, added a fun dimension to, um, you know, what I was already doing, exploring. Um, you know, it, it's, I just find it fascinating that, you know, without time, it can't technically exist. Um, because if you have like just two dimensions, you know, width and height, then if it has no depth, it's just a flat plane, you know, it doesn't exist in the three dimensions as we know it, we can't interact with it. Um, but it's the same thing with time. You know, if it has no span of time, then we're still unable to interact with it, even if it technically has three dimensions, um, the width, height, and depth. And so thinking of it as the fourth dimension when, when working with dimensional work, it was just really intriguing to me. Um, so dabbling, dabbling in motion was just really, I don't know, I found it really, really rewarding. Um, I started doing a lot of little stop motion animated pieces like this. Um, not all of them were well executed, but you know, you, you live and learn, you figure out, um, you know, how to, how to do everything, how to get consistent lighting, how to, um, you know, set up composition with motion in mind, um, things like that. So as I, as I kind of started incorporating more interesting concepts with um, my work, then I started getting some interest from clients that I'd really wanted to work with for a long time. So this past summer, um, I got to work on this social campaign um, with Target, um, which is a lot of fun. I'd really wanted to work with them for quite some time. And so I got to use like angles, different surfaces, um, you know, like painting the, the lettering on the, the canvas there, um, but then, you know, visible from, from this kind of 45 degree angle to kind of show off the product as well, or like using, using multiple objects as a canvas, as in on your right there, um, yeah. you know, kind of almost an anamorphic approach, um, which is a lot of fun. Here's a piece that I did for um, Circles Conference, which is a conference in Texas um, using their, their tagline. I was really proud of this, this um, the concept behind this because um, it, it kind of, I don't know, I feel like it shows off the concept really well. Um, it's, you know, the circles is the name of the conference and obviously my composition here is kind of a circular form. And then also like the, the cycle motion, um, you know, it's just, it's kind of showing the, the circles again, um, 
through the the cyclical animation there. And, and does, then, does the director there, does the client give you, how much information do they give you is my question is, is um, do they give you a lot of direction or you come up with the solution in terms of its creative execution? Um, it varies a lot. For this one, I really had free reign. So that was a lot of fun. I got to kind of um, create, you know, just whatever I wanted. Um, and I was able to like, as you can see, like this is pretty much um, all made of like weird stencil forms kind of. I was, I really like um, stencil type a lot. I have kind of a fascination with it. Um, and so I was like, hey, well, how can I work in stencils into, you know, this? And so like with these, um, you know, the medium of the leaves, I have everything kind of broken up, you know, it, again, bringing in kind of abstraction to it. Um, and then as well with the the pastels there that kind of show the, I don't know, just art materials for being inspiring and creating things like that. Um, you know, it's all like kind of broken up into fragments, um, sort of a stencil approach. So that was really fun. I got to indulge kind of a side interest while working on this. Um, and, you know, he liked it a lot. Um, he basically gave me free reign to make whatever. Um, other projects, I might have a lot more creative direction. Um, the the target one um, had had to work with the creative team there. Um, I, these were all like my my concepts and everything, but I definitely had to sell them a little more than I would to say the you know the director of the conference there, um, you know, and kind of show them you know a lot of sketches and how it should look. So that was it's you know different different clients will will give you different amounts of information, um, but yeah, it, it varies a lot. <laughs> I think um, this one, again, was a personal project, um, but um, maybe I can, you know, somehow sell the whoever is in charge to let me make some actual official ME artwork at some point. Um, <laughs> but those, those are my hands. Um, I was scrubbing gold paint off of them for like a week. Um, oh my God. <laughs> but it was, it was really interesting, you know, kind of creating the composition here and then, you know, like shooting different elements and, you know, having my hands in there and whatever. Um, it's quite an adventure, especially doing it all on my own. Um, so <laughs> that was really fun. Um, fun, fun little side project again, kind of showing the concept of like reimagining the Emmys trophy as like the, you know, with the moving parts um, and then the, the actual hands. Um, oh, um, I had, I miss, I think I'm missing a slide there, but oh well. I um, got to work with Hallmark actually. Um, a few months ago on some some holiday work that was supposed to be available for um, this winter. But unfortunately, as, as often happens with these larger clients, um, you know, the work was killed off um, before it was printed. So it won't be on shelves, unfortunately, but um, but I really enjoyed doing these projects, um, you know, kind of playing with, um, you know, just the you know, different different forms you can do with paper, um, whether it's like the little fragments kind of mimicking snow or like the traditional paper snowflake style. Um, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, this piece as well with the you know, really Christmassy colors and everything. Um, so yeah, so it won't be on shelves, but you can see it here. <laughs> It'll live on in my portfolio. <laughs> wow, it must've taken a while to put together. It was, yeah, it, it took, it took a lot of time and wrangling pine needles can be painful as well. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it was, it was a fun experience working with their creative team as well, even though it's not actually going to be on shelves. Mm -hmm. uh, a few months ago, um, again, I had an opportunity to work with a client whose um, mascot has large ears and looks like a mouse. Um, I'm okay. technically not supposed to take credit for it because um, they, they're pretty picky about their like IP laws and everything and protecting their like, you know um, brand image. And so like I can't put my name on this necessarily, but I can show it to you. And um, as somebody said, you know, who like texted me about it or something. They said they saw it and they were like, you know, th I was thinking this person really looked at your work a lot before putting this together. So oh. yeah, so I got to put put this animation together um, huh. that ended up on, on Disney's YouTube channel, which was a lot of fun to see. Um, this was, you know, obviously working in very large scale um, wow. and um, yeah, fun kind of animating everything um, and shipping this little video. Um, you know, a lot of different materials there, but mm -hmm. uh, really fun. Um, I don't know, just, just fun to do, uh, fun client to put in the, the client list as well. 
Um, so yeah, so you can kind of see, um, you know, a, a lot of progression in my work and just the ideas that I'm trying to come up with. Um, yeah, as, especially as I continue to teach myself different things like, you know, stop motion animation, um, you know, like basic photography to create this stop motion animation, you know, using After Effects, things like that. Um, again, I just keep, you know, teaching myself things as I go. Um, and that's kind of my, my methodology is, is pretty vague. It's essentially, you know, you, you learn, you figure things out as you go. <laughs> the more you explore, the more, the more skills you'll ha learn you have to teach yourself. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, and honestly, I think that, um, you know, it just, it just shows you don't really need the formal training to love letter forms and create letter forms. Um, you know, it's always helpful to have, you know, a degree you know, but you don't really have to go to um, the Hague or University of Reading or something to get a master's degree or a PhD. You know, there are just so many resources out there um, that you can use to learn on your own. Like, you know, the, um, the Type Dojo and, you know, a lot of what TypeEd is doing as well, um, just resources out there that you don't, you know, you don't have to earn, you know, a, a you know, post-grad degree um, to, to really just have fun with and make letter forms. Um, and I, I was really intimidated at first because I knew like all these people that, you know, they've been to school for this, you know, they're very scholarly and, you know, and I felt like I didn't really have room to play because I didn't feel like I had the qualifications. Um, but the more I, I worked at it and studied and practiced and everything, you know, I just kind of realized, you know, you don't, you don't need the qualifications to, you know, teach yourself and access all these resources that are available now. Um, so that was that was really good. You know, I kind of learned that as I went along <laughs> and stopped being so intimidated. Um, so you just need to be able to, you know, like obviously love letter forms enough to spend a lot of time with them and work hard on them. And, you know, again, um, accept the criticism as well. Um, so, yeah, I guess returning to my original thought line, um, you know, it's it's really all about um, making words into images and kind of fusing um, I don't know, concepts, concepts with words and images. Um, so you're, you're kind of speaking on multiple levels of communication. And it's really intriguing when you think about it that way. You're speaking intellectually, visually, um, you know, sometimes auditory as well. Um, you know, sometimes over the span of several seconds as with the little animations that I've been doing. Um, you know, just endless, endless possibilities. You know, it can be humorous, it can be inspirational, it can be irreverent, you know, meaningful. Um, but I find that like, even, even in the humor that, you know, you can do with words, there's sort of a gravity in working with words just because of the importance of language, I guess, in, um, you know, how a society is built and maintained. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing to me to, um, basically create communication this way. Um, you know, words can change lives. You can actually kind of speak into being almost, you know, like in the, the, story in Genesis in the Bible, you know, where um, the kind of immortal words, you know, fiat lukes and there, and then, and there was light, it was created, um, you know, but then in a very, very practical real life sense, um, you know, you can, you can speak something and it will create something in somebody else's mind. Um, you can show them something, you know, or like a visual form of words and it will again, you know, it'll create something in someone else's mind that was not there before. It's, it's such an incredible power. Uh, you know, that words have to be able to spark, spark things. Um, and, you know, they can incite change, they can provoke to action. Um, and I think you know, at a very fundamental level, I think that's what I find so incredibly compelling about, you know, lettering, because you're, you're shaping communication, you're speaking to people through right. visual forms of words. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just, it's so beautiful to me. Um, I find words to be intriguing and I find it to be an honor really to to work with them on a daily basis as we really all do in some way, shape or form. So it's it's really, um, lettering has the power to create. And I think, I think that's what I find most compelling about it. So yeah, thank you. I, that's, I that's love all. that perspective. I love your perspective and also Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Joseph, I'm just going to close that window, that screen okay. share. So if you want to just go back. Yeah. And, yeah. Awesome. So no, thank you for sharing. That was, that was mm -hmm. great. And I love your perspective on words. Like I never thought of mm -hmm. it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I guess you've lived it that way. And that's, that's, I mean, that makes sense, you know, because we do yeah. communicate uh, through language. Do you feel yeah. like that is the reason why uh, lettering has become, has been going through such a resurgence? 
Um, I think it might, it might have something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like, um, you know, it kind of goes through cycles, you know, like typography, you know, like the trends you see at cycle, like we had kind of a modernist cycle, you know, a few years back with everyone just using Helvetica, you know, things like that. Um, and obviously there's, there's a certain power and impact there as well. Um, you know, but then similarly with the kind of ornate or, um, more stylized, you know, organic sort of lettering as well that has, has kind of come back into style, um, you know, different, different styles say different things, you know, it, um, affects culture. It goes along with culture and you can actually, um, kind of see cultural trends go parallel to, um, you know, trends in design and typography and lettering. And it's really fascinating to see just, you know, the, um, the zeitgeist, <laughs> you know, the way, the way people communicate changes. Um, and honestly, like working with words, whether it's, you know, type lettering, anything, um, we really, as designers, we have a small say in that. And it's so, I don't know, I find that to be so, um, inspiring and intriguing about working with, with lettering and type. It's because we can affect the tone or the inner mm. voice in our head, right? Yeah. Like someone reading it when they read the words. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to just ask you a question from Johnny. Okay. Yeah, so okay. he's asking, do you most, do you mostly work from home at a studio somewhere or on site with your clients? And how do you set up your work area, especially with all the different materials and items mm. and working from different locations, if that's the case? Yeah, so I have um, I have a pretty lo-fi setup. I do work from home primarily, um, you know, where I can you know push things aside and create a space, um, you know, to to work with, you know, however however large of a space I need. Um, I have you know some some strobes and reflectors and everything that I can use to kind of help get the consistent lighting because when you're working with you know a hundred frames, you don't want it like flickering, <laughs> um, you know, with different slightly different changes in light, you know, um, shadows and whatnot. Um, so I, the lighting is pretty necessary to get an even, even color. Um, but yeah, I, it's a fairly, fairly lo-fi setup, you know, I'm tripping over cords and tripods, you know, sometimes, but I, I try to be, um, you know, careful with all of that. Um, yeah, I, I, when I'm usually setting something up, it'll be at home, uh, you know, where I have space to maybe leave it out. Um, you know, um, it's, it's um, going to be a bit of an adventure recently, um, you know, have, have a dog in the picture. So it'll be an adventure keeping them out of, out of, you know, things that are staying up overnight, you know, for a shooting setup and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so pretty much from home, um, okay. you know, just, yeah. Johnny, I hope that answers your question. So I'm going to hit done answering. And also do you, um, have you ever worked on site with clients? Um, you know, I have not actually, okay. no. <laughs> I've been um, like on site a couple of times as an assistant, um, which has been really, you know, interesting. You get to see how different people work. You get to, you know, interact with different photographers or, you know, studios and whatnot. Um, and that's really interesting. But I think, yeah, I don't, I don't, I've never worked on site with anybody, oddly enough. I'm trying to think. It, it seems like I should have, but yeah, I think I've, I pretty much, I'm very much a DIY person, you know? Um, and so, you know, like I, I strive to make it look like, you know, it's, it's done in a studio at a big agency, you know, but it's really, it's honestly a pretty small operation. Um, okay. you know, I set high standards, but, but my, my space and work set setup is pretty simple. <laughs> right. And, um, if you guys have any other questions, please put them underneath the questions and topics. Otherwise, I have three questions of my own. So oh, okay. we've got about uh, 10 more minutes or so. So if you have any questions, oh, well, let's see here. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, so my question for you is just based on Johnny's question in terms of working mm -hmm. in the studio, working from home. Um, did you do all your learning from online? I mean, you're doing your, most of your work online. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. most of your interactions with clients are online. So yeah. did you work with anyone online or did you work with anyone in person? Did you learn from anyone, you know, mm -hmm. like where they're sitting in a studio mm -hmm. with you or is it all from what you've learned online? And yeah, online? it's pretty much, you know, whatever I can gather online, you know, reading a lot, um, you know, books, um, you know, finding resources. Cause there are just um, so many resources out there now, um, you know, that there's just, I don't know, just a wealth, wealth of information um, and a lot of practice. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I really, um, I, 
I, it's kind of strange realizing that like I have no um, like formal education whatsoever. Like I don't think I've ever done um, even a lettering workshop. Although although someday I want to go out and do one with um, Ken Barber. Oh yeah. Um, but I've I've not you know been able to make it out to one of those. Um, but yeah, just so many resources. And again, like you guys with TypeEd, you know, are providing some of those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just you can you can do it from anywhere, um, right. and it's I don't know, it's incredibly helpful. <laughs> it does take a lot of hard work, though. It does. You have to be, you know, practice. yeah, you assign yourself homework. You know, you're essentially like your own professor. <laughs> yes. And, so. I, and I have a bad habit of taking mm -hmm. my milestones and dragging and dropping them to the next day. Mm -hmm. Where I'm like, oh, I don't have time to do that today. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Mm -hmm. You have to be uh, hard so on yourself. You're talking about there's a lot of resources out there. What, what mm -hmm. resources did you utilize? Are there any websites or books outside of the calligraphy one that you could share with us? Um, yeah, well, I would say um, you can always ask questions of people, honestly. Like if, if there's someone you admire, you know, sometimes they might not be able to get back to you for a while because often they're busy, you know. Um, but people are generally really um, generous with, with time and, and critique. Um, you know, so you can always feel free to reach out to, to people who you think might have, have relevant, you know, um, you know, be able to cast an eye on whatever you're doing and give you tips. Um, there are, um, I don't know, I would say, um, yeah, look, look for, for resources from really qualified people, you know, like people you can see their work. Um, I, I have a few books that I would really recommend. Anything by Doyle Young, it's like Donald, but with a Y instead. Yeah. <laughs> but any of his work is really amazing and helped me a lot. Um, I got one of his books, um, Dangerous Curves. Yes, that's that, a good one. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And they're not cheap, you know, but, um, you know, I got mine, I think, used and, you um, you know, you can always, always find, you know, used ones. Um, and it's, you know, helped me a lot understanding scripts and the way that everything, everything should look um, just because, you know, he has had, you know, decades of knowledge, mm -hmm. um, you know, so books like anything from Doyle Young, um, there are a couple of great ones from Louise Feely, um, like her book on scripts um, is great as well. It just shows a lot of different, you know, cultural influences on different styles, um, a lot of information there, visual information. Great. So. We love the masters, right? Yes, for sure. <laughs> okay, so another question. Erica is asking, do you provide comps or mock-ups using these materials to the client? How do you know it will work out? Yikes. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great question. Mm -hmm. That is right? a good question. A good yeah. question yeah. Honestly, um, I, I generally, before building it out, I just do sketches. Um, so if something is really malleable, um, then, you know, it's, it's not too difficult, but, you know, there will always be um, different considerations, um, you know, like different substances might melt <laughs> or like run, you know, things like that. Um, and then, but so with something like objects, um, you know, I, I um, kind of just fly by the seat of my pants, like the one, the animation that, that I did for Disney, I kind of, um, again, just did a lot of sketches showing like, here's what I'm gonna use. And then I, you know, once, once it was approved, you know, I went out and bought materials, you know, the blocks, the, you know, toys, um, things like that. So, and then also used some materials that they, they sent to me as well. So I had at least something there to work with in terms of, you know, dimension and scale. Um, so yeah, honestly, I, I don't um, really do a lot of material tests ahead of time. Um, if, if there's something that I could foresee, you know, having issues with, I would want to, but yeah, I, I don't really, I prefer not to build something out before it's approved <laughs> oh so what you provide to the client is basically sketches mm -hmm. just the thought process and then you don't do you don't do any photos or anything like that not really i guess there's a level of trust there in that mm -hmm. you know they're they're trusting me to provide you know essentially what my sketch describes right. um but yeah it pretty much just sketches um you know color schemes things like that oh, that, so. would, that makes sense okay i hope that helped Erica. But yeah, that's a good question. I mean, actually, you had a photo on um, Instagram, which was lettering in snow mm -hmm. and dirt. And yeah. I was wondering, how do you how? Do, I mean, I don't know if that was a client project. My guess is probably not. Yeah, that was just it was a client project. How would you describe that for the client or how you would how would you pitch that? Man, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I guess everyone knows what snow looks like, you know. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'd, I'd give like a written description as well as the the sketches. Um, that would be a little tricky because, um, you know, snow is not just a material that you can go out and purchase. Um, right. So now that I'm in, you know, 
the Bay Area, you know, if I were to do something like that, I'm not sure how I would pull it off. Um, it would require travel, I guess. Um, you know, find somewhere where there's snow. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, that would be really interesting, actually. Um, but that that was kind of a, a personal project, you know, just because it was like, um, it was like nature's April Fools, you know, and snowing on April first or whatever, um, you know, when we're all ready for spring. <laughs> but pitching something like that with with something perishable, yeah, that would right. be interesting. Right. So the food topography must be difficult mm -hmm. as well. Like you would have to actually experiment yeah. with that material before you use mm -hmm. it for a client project. You'd have to have yeah. a lot of snow experiences. I yes. guess. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, especially because, you know, you don't really know how something is going to, um, you know, react until you get your hands dirty, right. you know, so, yeah. One thing you did talk about, which is actually a thread through most of our type dojos, um, Martina Floor mentioned this, mm -hmm. uh, Gemma O'Brien also mentioned this, um, is that the side projects really make a difference. When you actually mm -hmm. have a passion project, like you do with the tools, the tools was not mm -hmm. a client project, right? It was something no. you were just interested in. Yeah. And you start to publish that, you get that work back. Like it, for some mm -hmm. reason, that's where they're, they're interested in. I mean, yeah. Gemma said that she was just doing this mural out of interest and all of a sudden she got clients from it. So mm -hmm. where do you find your inspiration for those, for you tinkering with those different materials, like, like the tools, where did that come from? Um, honestly, I was, I was just like digging around in the garage, um, I think at my parents' house or something, and I found this box of tools and it was like all these tiny little pieces. And I was like, hmm, something could be done with these, <laughs> you know, it's like some, something just kind of, you know, occurs to me on occasion, you know, something like that. Um, and that was, that was fun, you know, because especially like you were saying, like the personal projects are key because they give you an opportunity to play, um, and experiment. Whereas with a client project, you're not often going to get that opportunity sometimes they'll you know say yeah just make whatever you want but most often they'll have pretty pretty strict guidelines for you know what what you're going for what you're representing um so the personal projects uh, you know they offer the opportunity to do something new um you know have fun with things you know and then once a potential client can see it and it's like oh that might be something i'm interested in whereas you know if you haven't done it before then you know they can't see it and you know, you can describe it, but it's difficult to pitch something that there are no reference for. So. Well, we totally, I mean, I look forward to seeing what you tinker with next and how yeah. your lettering evolves, because mm -hmm. every time I look at your Instagram, it's something mm -hmm. different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I do like to explore and kind of evolve, uh, which I don't know. People say you should have a very specific style, you know, to sell yourself as an illustrator. I don't know. I mean, I, I think maybe that would be good from a career standpoint, but I, I figure, you know, I want to be able to do something that I have fun with and, you know, are, I'm always learning and growing. So yeah. I love the idea <laughs> of reinvention. I mean, typically mm -hmm. musical artists will do that, but, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, visual artists don't. And the fact that you're doing that, you know, definitely caught my eye. I've mm -hmm. been watching you for the last three years since uh, yeah. we met in Washington, D.C. It's amazing how far you've come. Uh, it is has been kind of a constant constant state of reinvention <laughs> so yeah that is true thank well you. thank you so much uh joseph for hanging out with us and uh, sharing your process and it was really great i really appreciate it yeah absolutely thank you for having me and thank you all for showing up too of course <laughs> yeah no right in the middle of the day mm -hmm. there's not very yeah, many yeah. Uh, people who could take lunch off but uh, would just love to see your lettering work that makes my lunch hour much better. <laughs> uh, I'm glad, glad to hear. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Joseph. Have a good day. <laughs>